Let me start by saying that generally speaking, my research looks at the technologies that we use to measure people. And I think that's essentially what we mean when we talk about big data, AI, smart machines. Um, and when these technologies measure people, they also change what is being measured. Right? And they also change how it is measured. There's a version of this in economics that they call Goodhart's Law, um, where the, when the measurement becomes the target, then you start distorting what you actually do to a person. So this kind of difference between how we measure and what happens after that is, is really what I study. But let me take a little bit of a step back because I think if we mention the word AI, there's so much talk, there's so many sweeping claims around it that I think we should be very clear about what we mean. So for me, the basic question is what do we mean by big data or algorithm or AI in a social sense? Because there are a lot of definitions available at a technical level. But at a social level, at a level where it actually impacts real people and real lives, what are we talking about? And I would say that really these are technologies for promising certainty, not actually delivering certainty necessarily, but promising it. Right? So this is the promise that, oh, the data is objective, so you can rely on it. The promise that, oh, the algorithm can predict criminality, so you can rest assured, the algorithm can predict which account should be banned from a platform or which person should be hired at a job interview. So at the root of all of those claims is this idea, this belief that if you have enough data, if you have enough computational power, if you have enough surveillance, then maybe you can generate enough information so that at least in theory, everything can be predicted and correlated. So, so that's not the reality, but that's sort of the claim, that's sort of the fantasy, a fantasy of over-communication, right? a saturation of information. We could think of it this way, right? Um, what if there was a, so, so I want you to, uh, I want all of us to do a little bit of a thought experiment here. What if there was a map that is so big, so detailed, that it shows everything in a country? And this was exactly the subject of a short story by the celebrated Argentine writer, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, so Borges has a story called On Exactitude in Science that addresses exactly this uh, thought experiment, right? He says, once there was a powerful empire and the science of cartography, of, of map making was so advanced that they eventually created the most accurate map anyone had ever seen. So it was a technological marvel. But of course, in order to do this, the map had to be exactly as big as the empire itself. And what, end, what ends up happening is people obviously find that it's too difficult, too annoying to use. And as you can see in this illustration, it falls into disrepair. But we can stop there and think, what would happen if everybody was forced to use this map? What would happen if we really created a map that was as big as the nation itself, and then use that as a basis for decision-making. Well, no matter how advanced the science is, this map will always be different in some way from the actual empire. That is a basic level of, basic lesson of mediation that we all know from media theory. So you would have to start making a lot of human decisions about what goes in the map, what doesn't go in the map. And if we started using this map as a basis for every decision about taxes, school zones, traffic, then we would probably end up with a situation where what is on the map becomes more important than anything else. What people can see with their eyes, what people talk about with their mouths, that becomes devalued in favor of what is on the map. So you start creating a hierarchy of different kinds of information and different kinds of decision making. And I think this is one of the ways in which we can think about the social life of big data or AI the difference between what it claims it can do and how it actually impacts social realities. And there's a growing voice that says, and, and one, one person is Kate Crawford, for example, the head of AI Now Institute. Um, she's argued that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligent. Um, so if we take this uh, in two pieces, first, the artificial side of it, what we call automation is often thoroughly human. Um, 
almost every application of AI that we see today, it involves what Mary Gray and Siddhartha Suri call ghost work. Ghost work is a lot of human workers who help make the AI work, but they themselves are made invisible. So for example, this was a famous startup called KiwiBot. So these are cute little robots. They're trialing them in Berkeley, California. Um, and the idea was that they would be totally autonomous drones that would deliver food. Now, the problem is, just like every AI driving technology in existence, like Tesla, it actually cannot operate in a fully artificial way. So what was the secret? It turned out that the KiwiBot was employing students in Colombia as cheap outsourced labor in order to help drive the robots. So what you get is a situation where the human workers still exist, but is devalued. Because they're invisible, you can pay them less and you can treat them worse. So that's the artificial side. And then if you look at the intelligence side, AI is also not intelligent in any meaningful sense of the word. There is a very common metaphor that AI learns, but there's nothing about the technology that learns in any kind of, any kind of way that's comparable to human beings. It is also not a general intelligence, meaning that it is not a technology that can be applied to every kind of problem. This is best explained by the Princeton computer scientist, Arvind Narayana. Um, he talks about this as a difference between pattern matching and social judging. So if you look at machine learning, which is usually what people talk about today when they say AI, machine learning can be really good at specific tasks in controlled situations, right? It's, it's pattern matching on steroids, but there is no robust evidence or theory that machine learning can be reliable for the things on the right, the predicting crime or predicting job success or analyzing emotion. There is really no solid theory um, or set of statistical evidence behind that kind of application. Consider, for example, this was very famous. This was in fitness last year. Uh, this was a study from a private university in the US where they claimed that they can use AI and facial recognition to predict whether someone is going to become a criminal, right? So very sci-fi. Um, and they said they could do it with 80% accuracy. These are extremely dubious claims. First of all, there's no rigorous scientific basis to claim a relationship between someone's face and their future criminality. There is no theory of the face or of emotion or of genetics that robustly supports a project like that. And even if you accept the premise, the 80% accuracy rate is curious because how do you derive an accuracy rate for prediction of future criminality? That's not something that you can verify in real life conditions. But despite these kinds of fundamental flaws, we still see these kinds of projects go ahead because they are able to sell the promise, like the promise of certainty. So, if AI is not artificial and it is not intelligent, but we keep using it in this way, what happens to us? What happens to our workplaces, our policing, our criminal justice, our social processes of decision-making? For me, my, my argument is that what we actually get is a lot of speculation. When you have these big data or AI systems and they aren't able to produce the objective information that they're expected to provide, when they promise certainty but cannot deliver it, what happens? Well, the people and institutions that use these technologies, they end up filling the gaps. They end up filling the gaps with speculative forms of truth making. So this is where you take a database that has a lot of flaws, but then you use it anyway. This is where your models may be very opaque about how they predict something, but you sell it to the police anyway, right? So this is where we take the data, the, take the AI, take the technology and start bestowing them with a sense of certainty and objectivity that they do not necessarily deserve. And, and this is really what I try to look at in, in the book. I, in the book, I try to go to a number of empirical sites where this kind of speculative activity actually happens, right? Where the technological claims collide with complex social realities. One such place is the Snowden affair, which began really in 2013 when Edward Snowden, as we now know, 
he began his massive, unprecedented leaks of electronic surveillance systems by the US and other governments, right? So this was a case where suddenly you have this huge international debate about how are the governments conducting data-driven surveillance? How do new big data technologies figure into this? So in other words, it was a debate about how data-driven technologies actually impact people's lives and our political participation. And the interesting thing about this was underlying the debate, I think there was a long-standing belief, a lot of assumptions about how information works or how the public sphere works. So Snowden himself is very much a classical liberal. He comes out and says, I am giving everybody this information because I believe that if I tell everybody the truth, I, if I give everybody the, the knowledge, then people will rationally debate this and come up with the best solution, right? So he has this belief in what I call the good liberal subject, this belief we have that people are like little rational information processing machines, this belief that we can engage in rational understanding and rational debate to figure out what to do with the technologies around us. I am a little skeptical about that <laughs> um, because one of the things that happened with the Snowden affair, I would argue, is a process where information compels speculation. So this runs a little bit counter to that classic uh, Carl Shannon theory, right? If we look at the Carl Shannon theory of information, he has this idea that the more information you provide, you reduce uncertainty. That's the theory. And I think in practice, we often see a process where it runs in reverse. I think we see that with climate change. We see that with a lot of COVID data as well. The more information you start giving to people, the more ingredients you're giving them to misunderstand, to disagree, to interpret in a different way, so on and so forth. And that's exactly what happened with the Snowden affair as well, because Snowden says, here's the proof, here's the information. Well, if you actually look at the proof and look at the information, it is almost impossible to decipher. And there were so many of these documents. There are so many that nobody really knows how many Snowden documents there are. And if you look at it, you start, it, it's very difficult to figure out what is going on. The one on the bottom right is interesting because that is something that the reporter said, this indicates that Angela Merkel's phone was being wiretapped by the US. You see uh, Chancellor Merkel written out in the middle. But if you just look at the actual quote unquote raw data here, it would be very difficult for anyone to figure out what this is actually doing without further context. So the Snowden affair started becoming an, becoming an opportunity for misunderstanding and conspiracy theory and paranoia as well as rational understanding. Okay? And I think this is further complicated by the fact that the technologies involved also are built to defy human understanding. So also I can give a simple example here. If when the NSA, the National Security Agency, the, the, the US agency primarily responsible for the surveillance, when they want to surveil somebody's email, they identify what is called a selector. So they don't know who you are, right? They don't have a list of everyone's names and everything like that. They find a selector. That's usually an IP address. It could be an email address. But for example, if they get my email address, then maybe that email address is used by multiple people. Uh, maybe I become a US citizen at some point in the middle and they have no way of knowing. However, this presents a legal problem because for the NSA, they need to follow certain laws for surveilling foreigners. And then for Americans or people who are in America, they are far more restricted in what they can do. But they have no way of knowing which is which because the databases are built in such a way that is so different from how we usually understand and document the world around us. And then when we get to the point where we as members of the public are trying to understand what is going on, I think there's a lot of opacity, right? there's a lot of complexity. And so I would argue that with a lot of AI technologies or big data technologies, the way they are built at a technical level runs against the grain. They contradict how we usually produce information and build our own understanding. And so, so that's the technical side of it. 
But beyond that, there's also a political and economic side of it that makes it really difficult. Um, if you look at Facebook, for example, they make conscious decisions to make their technology harder to understand for members of the public or politicians. One of the key issues right now is a lot of researchers and politicians say, we need access to Facebook's data in order to better understand the patterns of disinformation or hate speech. So Facebook usually says, we cannot give you access to anything, right? They, they shut it up. That's a conscious decision they make. And then sometimes they make a big show of providing data to researchers. For example, Social Studies One was their initiative. But we now know that the data was so error-driven and so incomplete that the researchers basically had to throw out their research, right? They spent years working on research with Facebook data, and then it eventually becomes revealed that the data was complete buck. It was so, it was so low quality that you really cannot use it to conduct good research. And then when you have third party um, researchers try to develop independent ways to understand the data, uh, for example, the Ad Observatory, which is based in NYU, Facebook used expensive lawsuits to try and shut it down and to intimidate the researchers. So there are these political decisions being made to try and make the technology more difficult to understand and more distanced from public debate and public participation. It's a deliberate politi politics of concealment. There's even a material and infrastructural level to this as well. This is a photograph of undersea fiber optic cables at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, might be the Atlantic. No, this one's the Pacific. Um, so these are some of the worldwide internet infrastructure that carries the data around the world. And we know that these particular cables were being directly tapped by the NSA for surveillance purposes. So when we try to talk about surveillance, when we try to talk about data, Sometimes it's literally happening at the bottom of the ocean. And so I think it is a huge stretch to say, you just give the information to people and we will understand and we will have a debate about it. I think that becomes very, very difficult at multiple levels. And that has an impact on how we talk about the solutions to this, the policy solutions or the social solutions. I think when we talk about solutions to data, surveillance and AI harms, we have a couple of words that we use a lot, right? Transparency, privacy, these are sort of the buzzwords that we go back to. And I think they are, in, <clears throat> excuse me, I think they're increasingly very, very limited. Um, and I think one of the issues with talking about things like transparency and privacy is they still assume this kind of virtuous cycle. They still assume that if you make something transparent, then everybody will look at it and learn about it. And if you understand it, then you will make rational decisions, right? It's this kind of very, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a caricature of the Habermasian universe, right? Um, but I think in practice, we know that knowing does not guarantee change. Think about the terms of service to a smartphone or to YouTube. Nobody reads it because it's too long. If you read it, you don't understand it. I don't understand it at least. If you understand it, it doesn't matter because you have no power to negotiate anyway, right? So it is entirely a performance of transparency that is not linked to any lever of power. What's the point of a transparent facial recognition system if you have to use it to get into school or to go to work? If you don't have any power, then the knowledge doesn't matter. And the danger, I think, is that transparency becomes this kind of neoliberal outsourcing it almost becomes a way for the government or the company to say, why don't you do the work? Why don't you read all the terms of service and do everything and tell us if we've done something wrong and we may or may not change anything that we do. So for things like transparency to work, we would need a healthy functioning information environment that provides a lot of the meaning and the context. And whether we look at this information today or with AI harms, I think the point is that the way these technologies are designed and sold directly and systematically contradict the conditions. They undermine the conditions for this kind of liberal subject in the public sphere. So that's sort of how it looks on the public side. 
right? Um, the proliferation of these data-driven systems can be a source of uncertainty, speculation, disempowerment. But what if we flip the lens and say, what if you look at the people and the institutions that actually use and produce the data? What about the police? What about the intelligence analysts themselves? Don't they have all the data? Aren't they in control? And I would argue, no. Actually, if you look inside these systems, as I said with the KiwiBot example, inside every AI system is a lot of human beings and a lot of politics and a lot of human decisions. And if you look at how it works inside, I think the pattern that we find is you don't have data come in and say, here's an objective neutral basis for decision making. Rather, what tends to happen is the data becomes used as a way to legitimize already existing prejudices and already existing decisions. Let me show you a couple of examples to this effect, to this idea that technology and data legitimize some people's speculation while delegitimizing others. What we can see in this slide is a video of a man named Sami Osmakach. He's a Muslim Albanian American. And on the left, the man with the mosaic face, um, he is Amir Jones. That's a fake name because he's an FBI undercover agent. What you have here was a situation where Sami Osmakach is a regular guy. He's living in America. He has sometimes been known to make extremist comments, right? You know, something about bombing America, things like that. However, there was no evidence that he was planning anything or he had the capacity to plan anything. He would just say angry things sometimes. However, at some point, the FBI, as a result of the data-driven surveillance, they decide that Osma Kart needs to be watched more closely. That's when things get interesting. This guy, the mosaic guy, Amir Jones, he pretends to be a regular guy and becomes friends with Osmakaj. He starts encouraging Osmakaj, saying, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to do something? Osmakaj in this video brings, uh, sorry, the FBI agent brings this guy to a hotel room, which is what you see here. And then the FBI agent gives him the guns. And then this guy, Osmakaj has never used the gun before. So here you can see him teaching Osmakaj how to use a gun. He teaches him how to wear a bulletproof vest. And then Osmakaj, this guy's broke. He's got no money. So the FBI agent lends him the money so that he can buy the guns. And then he still doesn't know what he's doing. So the FBI agent calls him a taxi so that he can go to the place where maybe he is going to conduct an attack. And then when Osmakaj gets there with his gun, all the FBI agents are waiting for him to arrest him for terrorism. And internally, the agents called this a Hollywood ending. They called it a Hollywood ending because it's very dramatic, but also because they were satisfied, now we have the evidence to convict this guy. That's why they go through all this, right? Because if you arrest Osma Koch before, based on a couple of emails, from a legal perspective, you may not have enough evidence to actually convict him. And that's why they go through all of this process, which takes months or even years, in order to produce the data that can lead to this conviction. And, and I wanted to show you this example because I think this is often what AI or big data looks like in practice. When you have a cutting edge technology, it doesn't work on its own. New technologies always work in tandem with old technologies, with old institutions, and with old ways of doing things. And it's that combination that becomes so potent. So it's not a technology first problem. These problems aren't caused by AI or data, but the technology becomes a way to intensify and amplify existing prejudices or existing ways of doing things. For a more documentable example, consider this one. Um, this is called an IMB survey, Indicators of Mobilization to Violence. So this is real, again, very old school. This is a paper survey. If you're an FBI agent and you are trying to arrest someone like Osma Koch, you have to fill out this form. So you're the FBI agent and you fill out the form in order to produce a score 
about how dangerous this person is. So it's very low tech data production. But have a look at the questions uh, that are actually on the survey. So the, the one on the top, number eight says, has the subject experienced a recent personal loss or humiliation, e.g. death, breakup, divorce, loss of a job, so on and so forth. So what's interesting here is if you got divorced, then you would start to get a score here, right? You, you would get some positive point. What about the next one? Have you ever experienced or been exposed to incidents like abuse or violent or violence or so? So if you're a woman, and you went through a divorce because your husband was a domestic abuser, then in this survey, you would actually start getting a higher and higher score, right? So this is literally where we can see how data has nothing to do with a purely objective extraction of reality. So many decisions and assumptions about human beings and about terrorism and about violence go into these kinds of questions. However, that's what the FBI agent sees. For the people on the other side, when we are reading news articles and say someone's been arrested, the only thing that we hear is that the sophisticated technology predicted that this person is going to commit a violent crime. So it's again that problem of a passive. I want to point out here one particular uh, tendency that is, that is notable in these questions. If you start to look at the questions in the bottom, they ask about cases like, has this person become religiously observant? Um, has this person changed their physical appearance? There's other questions about whether someone has contacted overseas extremists. So from the American point of view, you can see what they're thinking about. They're thinking about extremist Muslim jihadists, right? They're worried about people who become devoutly Muslim, they grow a long beard, they talk to someone in Pakistan. That's what they're worried about. However, what if the terrorist that we're looking at is a domestic white supremacist? Then those questions have nothing to do with that, right? You're not gonna suddenly change your physical appearance. You're not suddenly going to become religious. So that's where we see that in a data production system that is supposedly more neutral and objective, it's actually very, very old prejudices and guesswork that feeds into it. Okay. Here's an even more explicit version of it, where this is uh, one of the documents leaked by Edward Snowden, and it was a PowerPoint slide internally used by the NSA. So they are training their own analysts on how to use the software and so they're using a fake name, right? So it's basically in Korea, right? It's a fake name, but the name that they choose to use is, is Muhammad Bad Guy, right? So it's, it's, you know, this kind of cartoonish, um, it's very cartoonishly six-year-old level of racism. And so that is an illustration of how these people are thinking about terrorism and their mission and how that bleeds into the data systems they create. The irony though, is that at a statistical level, the majority of violent mass killings in the United States since 9-11 have come from white supremacists and not Muslim jihadists. So statistically, the larger danger has always been from white supremacists, right? And if you look at the words they use, words like lone wolf terrorist, they primarily use it now to talk about, um, again, Muslim jihadists, suicide bombers. But if you look at the history of the word, the word lone wolf was actually invented by white supremacists, right? The Aryan Vanguard is a famous long running white supremacist website and they talk about this as something cool, something heroic, right? So here's this irony where in the pursuit of data, in the pursuit of this kind of high technological surveillance, what you end up doing is reproducing and legitimizing the kind of speculations and prejudices that you have been using for decades and decades already. It is this kind, and, and that I think is actually what makes data and AI so useful. If I own a corporation, if I am the CEO of a company and I bring in an AI system, it's not that useful to me if it always disagrees with me. It's much more useful as a way to legitimize, legitimize myself.
it's much easier for me to say I am firing 300 people today because the data says I have to do it. It becomes a way to divert responsibility and accountability. So in the book, one of the things that I try to do is make connections across different places in society where these dynamics are, are playing out. Because from a methodological point of view, my concern was that if we look at only a single context, then we miss the wider pattern of what happens when similar technologies are applied elsewhere. So, you know, for some people, they might say, I have no problem with anything I've seen. This is for anti-crime, anti-terror. I haven't done anything wrong, so I'm not afraid of it. Some people could say that. But then they might turn around a few years later and realize that the same technologies and the same logic is being used in their job interview, which is literally where we are at today. So in the book, I try to look at this by turning to a different context, specifically the popularization of self-tracking technologies. And these are something, these are things that have become increasingly popular over the last decade, right? Um, these are devices that encourage you to conduct surveillance on yourself and generate data about yourself. Um, so there are so many examples. The, the one in the middle, everybody knows now, is Fitbit. We have Apple Watch, um, Galaxy Watch. Um, these things will monitor your heart rate variability, your level of exercise. You have funkier ones as well. Like the one on the left is called Happy Fork. It tries to monitor what you eat, and then it tries to give you information about the nutrition value in your food, you know, whether you should be eating more or less. Um, so, so that, you know, there, there are so many other devices for measuring sleep, for mood, uh, for women's periods, uh, for sexual activity, for emotion, for friendships. There are so many applications there. There are also applications of self-tracking that try to then intervene in your everyday thought and behavior. The one on the right is called Think. So the white, uh, white device that you see there, um, it's basically um, electroencephalogram, the EEG technology that you see in neuroscience. And what they do is they basically send electrical stimulus to places in your brain to try and make you more energetic or more calm. So with think this, um, this device, it is the promise that you can track yourself, you can survey yourself, but then you can also enact these kinds of data-driven interventions in a very fine-grained way. And so the broader promise that these industries were pushing for the last decade is the promise that the data will know you better than you know yourself, right? That was the promise. The promise is that you're always lying to yourself. Yourself. You lie or you forget about how much food you ate, how much you studied, how much exercise you did. You're not in control. Why don't you use the data and use the technology to make objective decisions about yourself? So I think we start to see the similarities or the resonances between these different contexts. But the problem here is that the data always travels. So when we initially say we're going to collect data just to track yourself, and this is a personal thing, it's very empowering, okay. But at a technical and economic level, data collection is only profitable if you can then use the data for something else, right? Facebook is not a profitable company if it just uses that data to develop its own product. We know that it only became profitable by selling people's data systematically to third parties or using the data that they obtained in one place for something else, right? That's how Amazon works, right? One of the things Amazon does is it starts selling people products and then it analyzes consumer buying behavior data and then it uses it to release new Amazon Basics products and it knows that these products will succeed because it has the data. So it's this kind of secondary or tertiary use of the data that is indispensable to the industry. And this is what I describe in the book as control creep, where you create the data for one purpose, and that's what people agree to, that's what people imagine, but it is always going to be sold and reused in different places. 
Take a look at something like Fitbit, right? Fitbit, like Apple Watch and Galaxy Watch, it's generally marketed as a personal fitness device, right? So if you look at the marketing material from Fitbit, it's very new age wellness culture. You know, it's very Lululemon style, right? Live your best life. And the kind of people that they show you, right? These kinds of young 20, 30s professionals, they're outgoing, they're, you know, swimming in the river for some reason in the middle. It's that kind of cultural <laughs> messaging, right? Go out there, you know, you are you, be you. Um, and, and that's sort of the initial context. And that's how Fitbit becomes a successful company. However, at some point, they need to explore new avenues of profit. So a few years ago, one thing that Fitbit started to do and other competitors started to do is partner with insurance companies. This one's from an American insurance company called John Hancock. And what they do is they say, hey, buy insurance packages with us uh, and we will give you a free Fitbit or a free Apple Watch as long as you share your data with us. Now, at a legal level in the US, you, they are not allowed to use that data to modify your insurance premiums. But that is clearly the horizon of potential use, that kind of secondary data. They also do this with gyms. So they'll say, buy health insurance with us, we'll give you a discount in this gym, as long as you send us your treadmill data. So it's that kind of interconnection where new users or new forms of judgment begin. And so there, there's a little bit of a pattern, right? It's first sold as empowerment. And then after that, it is sold to people other than yourself. It becomes new opportunities for other people to judge you and make decisions about you. We can understand this dynamic through a couple of newer developments. First, something that we are seeing already, something that I think folks in this room already know about, the use of AI hiring systems. So, if we remember the very early example that I gave today of the Harrisburg facial recognition study catching criminals, um, it is very similar. AI hiring systems are based on extremely shaky and unproven science. Because again, there is no robust theory about what is it about your face that is going to make you a good worker. What is it about your face that tells you something about your emotional profile? That is very, very shaky, right? And I can, I can talk more about this later um, if people are interested, but about the science, but there's no robust proof. However, as all of us know, um, South Korea has been one of the pioneers in rolling these systems out, right? Um, and even though these technologies are extremely flawed and speculative, there's a power element. Once the biggest companies start using them, we have no choice, right? It doesn't matter how transparent it is. We have to learn to use it. Um, and one of the things that have been happening is now you have new Hagwon in Korea that trains students to beat the system, right? So you go to these Hagwon and they teach you, this is how it works, this is how you have to smile, um, and this is the, these are the words that you have to use. So this points to a wider pattern that we see over and over again. The technology promises that the machines will understand us and they will adapt to us. That's the promise. But in reality, we are the ones that have to adapt. We are the ones that have to change. Just like the people that, just like the way you have to talk differently in order to make the smart assistant understand you, right? When you talk to Siri or Alexa, you have to start talking slightly differently. So it's not Siri adapting to us. We are adapting to Siri. And we see that in a much more serious way with these kinds of AI-driven technologies where we are wasting our time sitting there learning how to smile for a broken machine. I'll add one more example here that I think is still relatively unknown or relatively new, but you're going to start seeing more of this in the next five years or so. Um, and this is real-time surveillance of drivers in their own cars, so in your own car. Uh, the car makers, insurers, and other companies are very, very interested in this, right? They're really pushing for this. And this is, again, control creep at work. Initially, you're likely to see companies say, this is for your safety. We're going to use it to uh, detect accidents or to analyze what happened. However, once you start detecting things like, are you using your phone? Where are you looking? Um, and a lot of cars already have cameras embedded in the steering wheel right? We just don't really pay attention to it. Once you have the data, 
there are so many other ways you could use it, right? Would you pass this data, this footage onto the police? Would you score drivers for unsafe driving? And then would you show that to the insurance companies? Car makers, one of the things that the car makers really want to do right now is personalized advertising. If I can watch you drive through the steering wheel camera like this, I can learn so many things about you. Are you using Android or Apple, right? Are you wearing Chanel, right? What kind of uh, profile are you demographically? And then I could use this to deliver personalized advertising through the dashboard, right? So that's sort of the near future we're looking at. Okay? However, again, if you look at the data itself, we should not confuse it for any kind of neutrality or objectivity. Again, there's so many decisions involved. Here's an example where the system automatically detects where you are looking. And you can see there it says eyes off road, right? So it's, it sees that as a risk factor. However, we know that there are so many ways in which this could be legitimate. Maybe you're trying to park and you're trying to, you're doing the right thing by looking at something on the side. Maybe there was a noise. And so there's so many judgments that go into this. And the question is, how are we going to know about any of that? And if the police or the insurance company or somebody else says you were driving unsafely, are you going to have any power to negotiate what that data means? Well, I would guess that we don't, because one of the places we're seeing it right now is with Amazon delivery drivers in the US. They are currently being scored using a similar kind of technology and it scores them on how safe their driving is. So imagine using that with Coupang or some of the Korean delivery services, right? Those people have to deliver at an extremely high pace. So you have to work so quickly, but at the same time, you are now being scored for unsafe driving. And that's going to lead to a lot of bad things. So, so again and again, what we see is that big data and AI sell the promise of certainty and they sell the ability to judge other people. And the result is not necessarily a more fair or objective way of doing things. Rather, these technologies, I argue, are very conservative. They actually intensify the kind of power relations that already exist, rather than creating something entirely new. So let me start to wrap this up um, in, so in terms of what it all means. Um, in the book, I describe these problems as honeymoon objectivity. So we talk about the honeymoon effect, right? So we talk about how we fall in love with something when it is new. And when it's new during the honeymoon, we think it's perfect, right? The perfect uh, smartphone, the perfect boyfriend, whatever. And then when, once the honeymoon is over at some point, we start to see the problems, right? And I think with technology and data, we are, constantly going through this cycle of honeymoon objectivity. We're going through the honeymoon over and over again. So in 2012, we say, hey, big data, this is a new thing. It's going to transform the world. It's going to provide certainty. And then the honeymoon is over. We realize that big data is not that new. It doesn't really change everyone's lives. But then we say, hello, machine learning, deep learning, artificial neural networks. And here we go again. So everyone gets crazy about Bitcoin. And then when it gets a little bit old, we have NFTs. We have Facebook. We realize uh, it's actually kind of crappy. We now have the metaverse. So there's this kind of vicious cycle of honeymoons where we repeat the same mistakes and we are encouraged to fall for the same dream over and over again, even though it doesn't really come true at any point. So what does it mean to do research at a time like this? What does it mean to do critical research and, and to talk about these problems? In the book, I argue that we have to try and get beyond the technological default. This kind of tendency we have to say, oh, is there a problem? Then maybe we can solve it with more data or with better technology. Um, and it's that kind of default to a technological solution that I think we need to grow out of, that, that it is the job of critical researchers to provide a language, an alternative language. Because right now, what technology does is they write their own exam. So they say, judge us on how accurate our system is, and then we will provide the definition of accuracy. Judge us on how efficient we are, 
And then we will define what efficiency means, right? E.g. how many uh, items of food they can deliver in an hour. And so they create their own standards. So of course, then they are going to look very, very impressive. The words that we use like efficient, accurate, optimization, they are often coming from the tech sector and they are not going to betray these technologies' interests. And I think what we need is more stories, more perspectives, more research that come from outside this language of technology. Something that helps us ask, what does it really mean when you say that the data is objective, right? Is there something aside from efficiency that is important about workplace surveillance or, or delivery apps? Is it really possible to predict criminality? What does that even mean? Because our technologies and our technological language, they keep us stuck in the same world. They keep us stuck with the same problems and the same solutions rather than helping us break away from them. So let me stop there um, and thank you so much. I really welcome any questions, comments or criticism you might have. And again, uh, please feel free to ask me in English or Korean, it's okay and I'll do my best to answer. Thank you so much everyone.